Welcome to World Culture. In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have, have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will take many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers. And we ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Andres Guadamus. So Andres Guadamus is a reader and intellectual property law at University of Sussex and, an ed and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of World Intellectual Property. Um, his main research areas are uh, artificial intelligence and copyright, open licensing, cryptocurrencies, and smart contracts. He has also published two books, and the most recent one is Networks, Complexity, and Internet Regulation. And um, I think you might know him best, actually, from his uh, blog, Technolama, um, which is, uh, and also like a Twitter account, right? A Twitter and a a very prolific Twitter account. He has also acted as an international consultant for the World Intellectual Property Organization, and he has done activist work with Creative Commons. And as many guests on this show, I'm very happy that this is where I know you from personally. So, Andrew, very welcome in this uh, in this episode of World Culture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation and the very nice introduction. <laughs> okay, we should just get started, right? So, um, the first, the first. Um, questions I want to ask you is about uh, something that I referred to earlier as maybe already a little bit of a, a, a dated or stale debate, but uh, you followed the EU copyright directive debate uh, very closely and you've written about it uh, extensively and especially um, the Article 17 discussions. Um, for those of you who are not, not familiar with the term, this is, uh, this is uh, often referred to as the upload filter. Um, um, the, no, this is up, often defined as an upload filter. So. Um, now, looking back to this, um, what are your feelings? Who are the winners and losers? And yeah, what did we lose? Or maybe did we have some wins? And uh, did it shape out like you predicted? Uh, well, it didn't shape uh, out as I predicted, I think, <laughs> in many ways. I think no one, uh, no one really could see what was going to happen eventually and how things are shaping up. I don't think it's finished, by the way. I, 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 I think... It's one of those debates that's probably going to continue um, as the national implementation is going to to, to take place. Um, I happen to be now uh, outside of the debate in some ways because of Brexit. Um, it it has taken us out uh, as we don't need to implement the digital single market directive, but it's it has continued to be a very interesting situation now. Perhaps to if we're going to talk about winners and losers, perhaps it is good to sort of frame um, a little bit which are the parties and which are the parties that were pushing for the uh, the implementation or the um, the vote that led to the digital single market directive. Uh, so this is sort of. What it's a long-running dispute between the so-called traditional copyright industries and the tech industry in many ways. Um, this battle has been going on for many years, um, actually, for from the early days of the internet. If you want to think of that term, uh, the traditional media media has been losing money and losing power as well. Lots of political power, lots of money, and then. They have tried to protect their business models, their business interests, um, in whichever way they can. And lots of times they have been trying to um, do this through policy making and through legislation, and try to convince legislators to pass laws that um, benefit them and particularly their their business models. Um, what has been interesting in the Article 7 of the Digital Single Market Directive debate is that traditional publishers somehow managed to capture the debate in Europe uh, by disguise, disguising their struggle, their, their business struggle, uh, in framing it into a fight against uh, the tech giants, the evil tech companies sometimes. Um, it was very interesting. I never thought, uh, probably one of the things that I got wrong in the debate was how political, but also how 
much of animosity was going to be against tech companies. And it's something that I don't think that many of us uh, foresaw. Um, I think that probably Brexit uh, and the election of Trump in 2016 changed a little bit the direction of the debate. I think that people were um, uh, very angry, sometimes very justifiably angry with the tech industry uh, in what they saw as sort of lionizing uh, very bad actors and um, giving voice to va- bad actors. So I think that uh, that sort of anger uh, towards the tech industry was uh, taken advantage of by many pol- uh, uh, many policymakers, but also uh, the traditional uh, copyright industries, and they sold copyright reform as a way of sort of a, giving a bruising or giving a beating to the tech industry in many ways. Um, and what happened was uh, the passing of this directive that I think it was narrow, but it still passed. And um, I, I still cannot talk about winners or losers because we don't really know what's going to happen, I think. Um, it may depend on many things. Uh, we are just starting to see the national implementations taking place. Um, we have to see what's going to ch- happen with the challenge at the Court of Justice of the European Union by Poland. Um, and the national implementations that we have seen, there is a very wide range of uh, implementations. We have seen a very draconian probably France would be a good example of this, to a little bit more light touch uh, in other countries. And I think that's something that we'll have to explore. Uh, We also have um, guidelines uh, from the Commission, uh, which I would say they're actually quite broad. So we don't know what's going to happen in the end. Uh, There is lots of leeway of what is meant, for example, for authorization uh, and licensing. So I think that's something that we may have to explore in the future. My own impression of what's going to happen uh, or, or uh, is that we still don't know. Uh, but um, I would say that probably the traditional media could be considered to be the winners, but they're acting a little bit like the dog that chased the car. They don't really know what to do yet. I don't, I, I don't see a very clear plan um, for now, the, inter- main, the internet remains the chaotic mess that we love and hate. So <laughs> I'm not entirely sure if we can talk about winners and losers yet. Stepping um, stepping away a little bit from the from the consequences for for media and new and old, but um, the directive also had some consequences for researchers, especially uh, the open science movement. People were really watching it. What what would happen? Uh, more specifically, the text and data mining uh, uh, clauses. So um, the copyright directive is supposed to make content mining or text and data mining easier for researchers. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about, like, did that happen? Um, Can we be happy with that result? And um, could it, it, or is there some room for improvement, especially in comparison with some other uh, regions and their specific uh, database rights, for example? Yes, uh, this is one area in which I think that the um, the digital single market directive uh, delivered and delivered more than many of us could have envisaged uh, or expected, uh, sometimes even hoped for. Um, perhaps to put things in a little bit of context, uh, the UK was the first country to pass this text and data mining exception back in 2014. This was uh, politically pushed uh, by by Google in many ways, uh, um, that they had the ear of the prime minister at the time, um, uh, David Cameron. Um, so there was there were some um, changes to the law in 2014, and that included text and data mining, which is an um, it, it's sort of a very broad um, exception that hasn't been applied a lot because well. Broad in some ways, it's narrow as well. Uh, it only applies to very few researchers. So um, you could you could claim that it hasn't had a lot of effect in the tech and data mining mining industries. Um, what has happened is that we were expecting to have an exception included in the uh, DSM directive, 
and we got two articles, two uh, which were uh, fantastic. In many ways, I, I couldn't believe uh, what I read when, I, when, when it was finally passed. I think that they're very generous in many ways. Um, researchers get uh, this uh, very uh, broad exception in many ways, but also uh, rights holders get the possibility of reserving the application of the exception. So in many ways, everyone wins. Everyone gets what they wanted. The exception also recognizes memory institutions, which I think there is a recognition that there are very important players in this area. And to be honest, I was uh, shocked at how good uh, the final text is. Um, so far, the national implementations appear to be keeping very close to the text of the directive in this uh, area. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. I think that there is growing understanding in general in in the copyright industries, uh, but also researchers and the tech industry, that text and data mining is a good thing. So I would say that this has been happening uh, for, for many years. Um, it started in the United States with the dispute that led to what is known as the Google Books uh, case. Um, that generated a fair use defense for text and data mining. And now it's sort of spreading. I think that now we can see a, a broad understanding and a broad recognition across the board that this is a good thing. And this comes from also copyright maximalist and rights holders. I think that, that there, there is a recognition that this could be good. Um, and not a little opposition. So, yeah, I'm very happy with that. Uh, we'll see um, how it plays out, um, but so far, so good. Okay. Well, it's nice to hear an optimistic note in this, in this series now. And now. Um, well, another topic, and, and uh, those who follow your blog and or follow you on Twitter, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not wrong to consider you one of the more geeky copyright academics or uh, geeky yeah. lover, loving uh, copyright academics. And um, just in light of everything, all the big announcements and everything that's been happening over the last year, Web 3.0, Met Metaverse announcements, and, and um, we were wondering about, like, what's your perspective on, on this? Do you have any predictions? Will we, will we like, switch to a, a meta copyright environment with... I mean, maybe possibly even bigger uh, copyright walls around culture. Um, do you see any like new issues emerge there that maybe now we can't even think about yet? Yes, um, I guess uh, also a, a bit of an introduction uh, may be needed uh, in this subject. Uh, uh, the the so-called Web three um, it's something called like that uh, to distinguish it from sort of what we understood as the Web. 1.0 and 2.0. Web 1.0 was the old web uh, unidirectional with very static websites. Web 2.0 is understood that the social media, user-generated content, more dynamic content creation. Web 3, as we understand it, it depends a lot in the definitions. And I know I'm being very academic about this and the definitions can change. But Web 3 as we understand it, is a little bit uh, supposed to have a little bit of a the financialization of everything. I don't, I'm not sure if that is an actual word, but the idea is that we are going to have in our browsers uh, wallets uh, connected to cryptocurrencies that are going to have funds, and these are going to act as uh, authentication everything that you do online is going to be authenticated using smart contracts and wallets and there is going to be the potential that you are going to get charged for everything so this is what one of the ideas they're selling it saying okay you are going to be able to go this, to this website and you don't have to enter any passwords your wallet your browser wallet your cryptocurrency world wallet is going to act as your identification um, sounds nice in principle until you realize but well, that also means that they can charge you for everything so um, any transaction if you've ever um, been in the cryptocurrency environment absolutely everything costs money and this can be quite scary uh, so i uh, it, it won't 
be perhaps surprising that I'll, I'm a little bit skeptical about that. I, I well, not a little bit, perhaps highly skeptical. Um, and I'm joining a large camp of people, not only academics, who are actually worried about this. Some of these developments, this camp includes uh, some heavy hitters, people who have, you've had in the show, like Cory Doctorow, um, uh, uh, a developer, Stephen Deal, um, has been very co uh, coherent in his criticisms. And now, uh, most recently, people like Evgeny Morozov, who has also been very critical about what is emerging as the Web3 space. Uh, there are a lot of game developers, a lot of, lot of people who understand the internet and do not like what they see. And I, I, I think I joined that uh, camp. The main concern I have really is, is that this is a movement that is not trying to solve any real problems, but it's pretty much a money graph in many ways. Um, it, it's push, it's being pushed by uh, venture capitalists uh, who want to pump a new solution now that the gig economy is gone. Now they got all these companies to get large valuations. They got money out of that, all of your Ubers and uh, Airbnbs. And now they're looking for a new uh, um, uh, cash cow. So the, the finance Realization, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that word, of everything is the next step. Everything is going to um, to have cost. Everything is going to be a transaction. Uh, so it, this, in many ways, is completely anathema to the understanding that we have of the open web that many of us uh, envisaged. Um, this is a really a sad future controlled by a few uh, venture capitalists, pushed by celebrities. And in many ways, it's a solution in search of a problem, uh, at least for the Web3. Um, the metaverse itself, it's a slightly different. Um, it may depend on what you mean. Um, depending on the definition, if you understand the metaverse as sort of a, a, a persistent 3D environment in which you can interact with other people, the metaverse has been in existence for decades, so it really depends. Uh, some of us, I would argue, have been living in the metaverse for many, many years. So many of the legal issues that are arising there, particularly with copyright, are things that were already discussed sometimes um, over a decade ago. Um, things that were discussed in things like Second Life. Um, and there was the first hype of virtual worlds back in 2007, 2006. Uh, so I'm also a little bit skeptical of, um, of what is being presented. Um, if we understand the metaverse as sort of this face, Facebookization, I'm sorry, it's, that's another made up term. Uh, of the metaverse, uh, this idea that Facebook is going is, is just going to be um, uh, transformed into the metaverse, that gives me nightmares. <laughs> to me, it's sort of the worst of all worlds. I hope that the metaverse uh, in, uh, actually ends up being a, a, an iteration of the virtual worlds that, that are more open, that, are, that they follow the openness ethos that, of the early web. Uh, but we'll see. We'll have to see what happens. Would you, a little side, side question, would you consider this like a threat to the public domain as we know it, like this evolution? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think all of this um, is, um, take, um, take any type of uh, Web3 development, you, there is nothing stopping people um, uh, enclosing the public domain. Uh, like Jamie Boyle tells us, you know, th there is always a danger that people are going to commercialize and close the public domain. Um, one, and, and they just start um, gatekeeping the, the things that we give for granted. Um, yeah, there's always that danger. Um, you can only access certain things. Uh, we are curating or they're promising us, oh, we're going to curate this amazing space and we'll give you access to it but you have to pay and you'll have to pay and to access all of this you have to uh, 
to have a cryptocurrency wallet. By the way, here is a cryptocurrency wallet and its cryptocurrencies are backed by all of these venture capitalists and all of these companies that are selling you the cryptocurrency are backed by venture capitalists, etc., etc. So it, it, to me, it's, it's the worst of all worlds, really. You've uh, you've recently you've you've been writing a lot about NFTs and and that's what I also asked about public domain because of course there is yeah there is a quite an awkward relationship yeah. or a perceived relationship between NFTs and, and and copyright and and I was just wondering if you could um, for our listeners uh, outline briefly some of the, the misconce misconceptions about NFTs and and um, maybe also just explain <laughs> for some people <laughs> listening what NFTs are to start yeah. with. Uh, I, again, uh, I'll have to start with the definitions <laughs> to be uh, defining everything. Oh my God, what, where do I start? <laughs> I could talk. The acronym. The acronym. <laughs> yeah, the acronym itself is a, it's a non-fungible token. Um, non-fungible tokens are a type of um, cryptocurrency uh, bound token. A token really is um, digital representation of absolutely anything. You can tokenize everything. You can tokenize um, anything that can be digital. You can generate some code that is going to act as a representation of anything. So you could, in principle, tokenize things like um, air miles. Um, you can tokenize songs. You can you can do avatars, all sorts of things. So a token really is just a, a code representation of something, of, of an asset. A non-fungible token, specifically. So perhaps... Uh, we need to backtrack a little bit. Um, fungible goods are things that are interchangeable. So things like if you're going to buy coffee, and it doesn't matter what type of coffee you're buying sometimes. Or, I mean, not specifically, maybe you're buying Costa Rican coffee, Peruvian coffee, um, coffee from Ke Kenya. But the actual specific grains that you're buying, they're fungible. You can interchange them. Things like silver, gold itself, could be fungible, They're, those are fungible goods. Non-fungible goods are things that are unique or specific. So you can think of um, a specific, um, very rare blend of Costa Rican coffee that only can be found in the mountains of a specific volcano. That starts being more close to what we understand as non-fungible. It's something that cannot be easily exchanged. So things like art are non-fungible. Uh, a statue or, or a painting that will be non fungible. That that is one painting. So non fungible token is a represent a digital representation or a digital token that represents something that cannot be changed and it, and also can be exchanged. So for example, you buy a non fungible token of a painting. You're buying something that, that you can. It's, it represents that unique item, but it's also something that you can exchange. Okay, so that is sort of what NFTs are, um, uh, conceptually. Uh, in practice, NFTs are just code. It's just a bit of code that has a link to the digital asset, that it can be stored anywhere. It can be stored in any service. It also has... Um, a, a uh, unique identifier is this every nft has one very unique number that is is, is generated whenever the token is gener is created and also an address and uh, this is an address that is going to be a wallet address so it can have other things it can have a title it can have the uh, have the author but generally speaking it has those three things and it's just code so one of the biggest misconceptions that I get really upset and really angry about is when people uh, think that by buying an NFT, they're buying the ownership of the underlying asset. So let's say I buy an NFT of a uh, board ape, now that these things are, are very popular, uh, people think, oh, I own this board ape. That is not true. You are not even buying a license. Uh, you're buying a piece of code that gives you a link, gives you access to a link to where that JPEG of a, an ape is located. But you're not allowed to share it. 
it's well, not like it, like it, if if it's licensed yeah. yeah sorry yeah oh no no it well it depends on on the terms and conditions of the license yeah uh, board apes give you a license um if it's very limited license and it's really badly drafted so i get okay. really upset whenever <laughs> People talk about ownership of these things. Um, some people, it gives you some digital rights. So, for example, you can print out T-shirts and some things, do little things like that. But that's it. You don't actually own the item, which is quite interesting. That people think that they own something and they're actually they don't own anything. They own just a code, a bit of code that sits in your wallet, and that's it. So that is the probably for, uh, the, the main thing that really really upsets me is that um uh, this misunderstanding that people think that they're actually buying something um, and also from a copyright perspective they are often they don't own the um, items they don't really uh, because they don't own them if you transfer the nft you transfer the token so for example i send you uh, a token of this llama picture that I have. Um, you don't. I don't own it. You don't own it. So I did not transfer copyright just by transferring the uh, the token. I hope that it doesn't end up being more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could. I as I mentioned, I can sp speak for hours <laughs> about the NFTs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, I, I'd suggest you, you. You've write like a blog post about this once every week, isn't it? So, yeah, something like <laughs> so that. I suggest people people go there and. Uh, yeah, uh, it's and, it's difficult to get your head around uh, all of this, and they. I, I think that they make it more obscure on purpose. And once you really understand that this is just a bit of metadata that you purchased mm -hmm. and that someone bought it for a million dollars or the equivalent of a million dollars, you start thinking, why? Why did these people do it? There is a lot of, uh, again, hype, a lot of uh, ulterior interest uh, in the space. There is a lot of uh, venture capitalist uh, money being exchanged. There are lots of uh, celebrities being pushed into pushing all of this to generate fear of missing out. Yeah, so, so it's a very interesting area. Yeah. Thanks. Apologies. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for these insights. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that I ask every guest on the show. Um, so um, the name of this blog is World Culture. And, and what we want to know of all of our guests is, is, can you remember like a particular moment where you hit that wall, maybe for the first time, and thought like there's something wrong with copyright? as it is yeah to me personally it was uh, i still remember it was the first time uh, early in my academic career when i was asked to pay for one of my own published articles and i was trying to get the pdf version of the article just to i, I don't know i uh, i wanted to give it to my students uh, or or link it in class, and I was asked to pay for it because uh, the university didn't have a subscription to that service. So I that's when I realized what is going on. <laughs> Why should I be doing this? And that led me to a life of uh, really of um, advocating for open access uh, um, whenever I can. It's not always possible if you're an academic. Sometimes it, th there is a punishment if you try to only publish in open access. Um, so, so sometimes it can be to the detriment of my own career, but I've tried to at least uh, be an advocate on, on that respect. Also, perhaps uh, going back to the Web3 debate, I'm also concerned a little bit that blockchains are an attempt to build new web world gardens. So it's probably closest to the dystopia that I can think of. So, <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, we, we we talked about copy uh, problems with copyright, like especially in Europe. But um, it's clear that it fails to adapt to the digital area era, not only in Europe but globally. And and I would just like to know from you, like, how can you can we can we can how can we make this work? How can we make this work in an online world, in a connected world, in a global, on a global scale? Um, what needs to change, in your opinion, and and how can we try to make this happen? And and in short, this question is, what should 2030 look like to you? Yeah. 
Uh, this is a difficult one. I, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have with copyright policy worldwide has been that uh, very often the people that are drafting legislation and policy uh, do not actually un understand online environments, and you, you can see it all across the board. Um, this is also shared, by the way, in other areas of, of digital policy, uh, but it's particularly bad in copyright. Um, Perhaps a new generation of digitally savvy people may do better and may be able to change things. Um, the so-called digital natives may be able to, to, to draft better policies. But again, um, it, then again, it could go wrong that they may try to push a version of the internet that is entirely commercialized and monetized. Um, I think that going back to some of the debates before, some of the reasons that I'm sometimes quite frustrated with current efforts towards decentralization is that the idea of, this, of decentralization that is now being pushed is a very commercial idea of decentralization. Um, I think that um, copyright policy in the past favored centralization, and I think that the future should be decentralized, but not uh, the decentralization giving me give me money for everything let's pay for absolutely everything we're a bit more open democratic media landscape and i hope that there is going to be understanding um, in that term uh, so i remain slightly optimistic i guess uh, we may get better tools um, um, as time goes by but perhaps uh, not enough good people to tackle it so maybe optimistic and pessimistic at the same time <laughs> We've um, just another side question. We, we've discussed. Uh, we, we mainly focused, of course, on, on uh, European copyright. Now I'm just wondering because you mentioned it a couple of times the influence of Brexit. Mm -hmm. Do you? Because we we didn't really cover that yet in this blog. Like like, mm -hmm. do you do you see any significant impact on on UK copyright regime caused by Brexit or like, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we, stopped by Brexit. Yeah, we are starting to see a little bit of. Um, Push toward the UK government is going to to try to become like a pirate haven in many ways on the on the wrong side of policy making. That the UK will allow all of the bad actors to come here just because we are in desperate need of funds, and um, it, you can start seeing with uh, some of the negotiation of free trade agreements, uh, the UK will say yes to absolutely anything. So um, my fear is that in order to get a US free trade agreement, they may say yes to the worst type of uh, IP maximalism that you can get from the United States just to just in order to get an agreement. Uh, so that it could be something that happens. Um, I think that there is a push towards uh, not only in copyright, but also sort of uh, get rid of all sorts of uh, good legislation, good policies that we have in other areas like uh, data protection. And my fear is that we're going to try to become like um, the worst in trying to attract the worst actors. Um, a, a regulatory black hole that where where everything is allowed and actually the worst practices uh, take place. That That is the nightmare scenario so far with Brexit, I think. Um, perhaps the good thing is that we don't get Article 17. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is probably the, the, good, the good news. The bad news is that we don't get uh, Articles 4 and 5 of, of uh, text and data mining. Uh, we are <laughs> stuck with our badly drafted 2014 version. So, yeah, that's, that's probably the best and good news or bad news. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for giving this perspective. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we, we haven't touched upon uh, this topic mm. previously, so it's nice to hear. Um, mm. Before we close, um, anything else you would like to get off your chest? Anything you'd like to say about copyright mm. in general? Any important issues we haven't discussed and that should be featured in this uh, in this episode? Um, I, I was thinking about uh, things that may or we perhaps that have not covered a lot. Um, and sometimes I, I start my classes with my students, uh, telling them uh, or talking about digital copyright in general. It reminds me a little bit of the famous words by Donald Rumsfeld, who wasn't a very nice person to begin with. But uh, his uh, theory of knowledge is always something that, that uh, I think can be remembered when we're talking about 
copyright uh, policy, and is that there are known knowns and there are things that we know that we know, and then there are known uh, unknowns. These are things that we uh, do not know, but there are also known unknowns, and those are the things that we don't know that we don't know, and that always. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of copyright policy. There are things that that we can see right now uh, that we know. Uh, there are things that w we cannot even imagine what's going to happen. And what scares me is that is the no unknown unknowns that uh, things that we haven't even thought about uh, that are probably now being devised uh, in 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 a shadowy land somewhere. So I think that's probably one of the things. Uh, I, the one thing I can think of that fits the unknown unknowns is perhaps artificial intelligence. It's a subject that perhaps is not that interesting for a lot of people, but I find it fascinating. There's been a lot of uh, academic interest in copyright authorship of artificial intelligence in general. But I think that probably what is going to shape um, corporate policy in the next few years when it comes to things like artificial intelligence is going to be the liability, potential liability of AI. And that's one thing that is trying to be tackled by things like text and data mining, but uh, it may prove to be very interesting in the future. We'll, uh, we'll follow uh, Technolama for updates on this as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Andres, thank you very thank you very much for this talk. I thought it was very interesting. And um I hope to be able to see you someday soon uh, in real life, uh, either in Paris or in UK. <laughs> yes, uh it will be very nice uh, to actually get out get out again and into the world <laughs> and stop uh, doing everything by Zoom. But it was fantastic uh, talking to you. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.